Alistair Sinclair recalls meeting David in January 1948, when having moved from small town Sydney, Alistair entered grade 7 at Tower Road School in Halifax. He says, I was seated in the second last seat on the right aisle, behind Mary Chipman and in front of David. To my surprise then, and even now, Mary and David spent much of the day drawing cartoons. One would draw four or five panels of a story and send it to the other to continue the plot. My job was to make the transfer of the scribbler containing the story. Back and forth it went. Given the total strictness of my earlier schooling, I was a bit concerned about my role. But reading the story helped, and the teacher never intervened. Mary and David simply overwhelmed me at that point. I had nothing to compare them with. Once later on, amazingly, David was at a loss for words. In grade nine, three or four of us were asked to choose someone to give the valedictory address at the graduation event. David and I were in the group. David said he would give the address if the rest of us wrote the script, which we did. And as I recall, he did read it. Very much the big brother. He was a very creative and fun brother. He was always setting up amazingly fascinating uh, projects and occasionally uh, being the younger person, I was allowed to partake, usually as some sort of assistant. But we did things like papier mache puppets, we made theaters, sometimes in a shoebox, sometimes more elaborately. Uh, David, of course, was, was mad keen on tricks, as in the magic tricks. So this became one of his ways of earning a bit of extra money. He'd uh, go as visiting magicians to children's birthday parties. To the gave good value for money. I always wanted to get into his, his magic suitcase, but I was threatened with the most dreadful fate if I ever dared try to find out how his magic tricks worked. So I never did discuss, I did uh, find out about things like the magic rings that, that went up in the air and nobody could understand how or why. And I suppose tied with his magic tricks was his uh, passion for horror and ghost stories. And he was a counselor, rather surprisingly, at a boys' camp in Nova Scotia in the summers, and he was known as Tricks there because of his, his uh, dad hand at magic, but also he was a great talker, the great talker storyteller at night because he specialized in telling remarkably creepy stories about severed hands and things, which of course all the boys in their bunks were absolutely frozen with fear, which they thoroughly enjoyed. That's one way to keep power. So yes, as Big Brothers go, he was a very good Big Brother, and then the whole uh, so-called electric railway room in the basement was actually turned into his creative cauldron. And we had everything from chemistry experiments to hot uh, liquids. I never knew what they were, but they usually made some remarkable effect. And all these other things went on, theater things, and puppet things, and oh yes, of course, we all had to have our astronomy lessons. When the weather was good, we'd lie in the lawn on our backs, and David would explain all about the stars and the planets. Lovely. So uh, I cannot you. complain about having uh, a heavy-handed or distant older brother. I'm very grateful for the amount of uh, creativity and fun that he uh, very much placed center stage in my childhood. It was just me and the sound effects man. Well, the sound effects man didn't have uh, any pigeons. Well, David became inspired to tell the party his pigeon story. You know, remember back then. He had lots of things with pigeons cooing. <laughs> but nothing more than that. Uh, but then an inspiration struck him, and from his second floor of the CBC studios, he suddenly raised the window on a pigeon who was just sitting there, <laughs> seized him by his feet, like that, like that. Uh, and held him firmly. The pigeon was perfectly comfortable, and the pigeons are very, very stupid. He just sat there. So in the script, whenever it suddenly said, pigeon squawks and flaps, the sound would invert him. I first met David when we represented our respective schools in the finals of a radio quiz program in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is Eleanor Duckworth speaking. I would have been 14, he would have been 13. His school won. Then the next year we went to the same high school and became good friends. 
He was famous in Halifax Euston for being so smart. Nobody else came close. I think it must have been tough for him, at least a year and a half younger than most of the other kids, and so smart and so small. I came to admire how he managed to be a teenager anyway, and I don't know anyone who didn't like him. What I knew best outside of school was his piano playing. I don't remember how this happened, but he became my duet partner. I played the violin for three years of high school and later went home for vacation. It was a big part of my musical experience. We mostly played sonatas. I recall no strife at all. We simply worked hard at being together in time and in musical quality. At the time, I don't think I appreciated how lucky I was to have such a partner. Though I did know that, he introduced me to music I would not otherwise have known. Near the end of our partnership, during university vacation, we performed one full evening concert, a solo or two each and a couple of sonatas. sonatas. He was way beyond that at the time, a very accomplished piano soloist, but it was thrilling for me. And I have to say that in one respect, we left high school as we left the previous school. He accompanied me as a soloist this time in a musical talent competition. At the same time, he was a competitor himself, playing the great gate, gate of Kiev. Once again, he won. Judith Keaston. That's right, isn't it? Yep. David was clearly a sort of thing apart from the local <laughs> high school gang. <laughs> <laughs> he even dressed and applied stage makeup. <laughs> Very cleverly, <laughs> to impersonate Ravel at a fancy dress party. I was probably the only one to spot the resemblance. I mean, looked up this Ravel man in my Percy skulls. Um, he was inclined to stand rather awkwardly on his own at student parties when I first knew him. Apparently scanning the bookshelves and finding nothing very interesting. <laughs> Later on, after becoming more familiar, especially following his memorably fine acting and directing of student drama, often avant-garde French plays of course, he became more dynamic in such gatherings. I leave out the colourful details. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next missive is from uh, Carol Sinclair. I first met David through the Glee Club at Dalhousie. It was due to him that we produced plays such as The, <laughs> the Little Foxes and Arsenic and Old Lace instead of Shakespeare. He was unforgettable as the mad Jonathan Brewster in Arsenic. I also remember him giving elaborate farewells and thank yous to the hosts at cast parties so that everybody would leave and come back in to play charades with a few select friends. <laughs> Mm-hmm.